Welcome back to the TCA Cycle Playlist. What I hope to accomplish in this video is to really understand the mechanism of succinyl coenzyme A synthetase. Also, what's really important for your nomenclature point of view is to understand the difference between synthases and synthetases. When I was in school, some of the biology professors referred to ATP synthase as ATP synthetase, and clearly it's not a synthetase, and sometimes people get synthetases and synthases confused, so we'll also go over the differences between those. Hi, right, welcome back to the playlist on the TCA cycle. In this video, we're going to talk about the mechanism of succinyl coenzyme A synthetase. So that part of the TCA cycle is right here that I'm circling. Okay, And what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to convert succinyl CoA into succinate. And in the process, we're going to generate a nucleoside triphosphate. So we're going to get a nucleoside triphosphate where the N is going to be either guanine or adenine. In other words, what we're going to get out of this reaction is going to be either GTP or ATP. And what we'll find about the mechanism of this enzyme is it can react with either GDP or ADP. Okay, so the point is, is we're going to get a nucleoside triphosphate where the nitrogenous base is going to be a purine. Okay, and by the way, what we're going to see in this mechanism, because you're ligating a GDP or an ADP with a phosphate, this is an example of phosphorylation. Okay, um, it specifically, it's a type of phosphorylation called substrate level phosphorylation. Okay. Um, Substrate level phosphorylation is very common. Um, ordinarily, when you're talking about substrate level phosphorylation, you're talking about processes that don't consume ATP, but rather generate ATP, or in this case, produce GTP rather than uh, burning a GTP. Okay? So in other words, this is a process by which we're forming a nucleoside triphosphate. Now, succinyl coenzyme A synthetase is a reversible enzyme, however, this cycle pretty much always runs in the direction uh, that we're going from succinyl CoA to succinate. So therefore, we're just going to refer to it as substrate level phosphorylation. It always runs in the direction of substrate level phosphorylation. The only other types of, of phosphorylation are going to be oxidative phosphorylation, which purely occurs in the mitochondria um, in the context of the electron transport chain, and photophosphorylation, which also involves an electron transport chain in the chloroplast of plants, and some photosynthetic bacteria. Pretty much every other phosphorylation that you'll see in terms of things that form nucleoside triphosphates, those are examples of substrate level phosphorylation. Other examples of substrate level phosphorylation that you should have seen at this point are going to be pyruvate kinase. Recall that pyruvate kinase forms ATP from ADP and also phosphoglycerate kinase. That would be an example of another one that turns ADP into ATP. Now, one thing that's important to realize is hexokinase and phosphofructokinase 1 from glycolysis, those are not substrate level phosphorylations because we're only talking about ones that form ATP or form GTP and so forth. Those two enzymes, hexokinase and PFK1, those are ones that burn an ATP or they hydrolyze an ATP or they're simple phosphate transferases that move the phosphate from ATP to other molecules. That would not be substrate level phosphorylation. Those would be considered ATP aces. Okay, so now that we've uh, looked at that aspect of this. Let's actually look at the mechanism of this enzyme. So um, this enzyme is first going to require an inorganic phosphate. And on the inorganic phosphate, there's a lone pair in one of these oxygens. And what this is going to do is it's going to facilitate a nucleophilic acyl substitution mechanism on the carbonyl that has the coenzyme A. Now this molecule right here is called succinyl, succinyl CoA. Okay. And the first step of the mechanism involves a nucleophilic acyl substitution in which we attack this carbonyl and generate a tetrahedral intermediate that is shown in the next mechanistic step right here. Okay. Now in this next step, what's going to happen is the tetrahedral intermediate is going to collapse in, reforming the carbonyl. And in the process, in the, process the coenzyme A is going to leave and effectively what it's going to do is abstract the proton right here from the phosphate group. And so what you should get coming off of here is totally protonated 
coenzyme A. So notice on coenzyme A, we have this hydrogen proton right here on the thiol. Okay, and in the process, what we get is this molecule right here, and this molecule is called phospho. Is called phosphosuccinate. Okay, what we'll find is in the next step of the mechanism, this is where we're going to form succinate, which is as we saw from the cycle picture right here, that is the one of the final products of succinyl coenzyme A synthetase. Okay, so let's actually look at it. Now, one thing we haven't mentioned up to this point is that there's a critical histidine residue in the active site that's shown right here. There's a critical histidine residue. Now, keep in mind this phosphate right here already has tetrahedral geometry. It's sp3 hybridized. So whenever this histidine residue attacks this phosphorus atom, it's going to do a, a nucleophilic acyl substitution, but you're going to get instead a trigonal bipyramidal intermediate. Okay? And I'm going to abbreviate the mechanism here, but suffice it to say, you'll generate the trigonal bipyramidal intermediate, the intermediate will collapse, and the leaving group will be succinate. So this molecule over here, this molecule is succinate, and notice that it is a terminal dicarboxylate, meaning that all terminal carbons have a carboxylate group, and it's four carbons long, okay? So uh, remember that in the alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase complex, we reduced alpha-ketoglutarate to um, succinyl coenzyme A, and in that process, we reduced it by one carbon from five carbons to four carbons, and in this particular um, reaction we're, con we're keeping the number of carbons constant so succinyl coenzyme A had four carbons succinate also has four carbons excluding the coenzyme A okay coenzyme A technically has carbons but we're excluding those so this part of the molecule right here we've kept constant in terms of the number of carbons okay so now we've generated succinate that leaves the active site now we have this residue in the active site this histidine now it's in the form of an N-phospho in N-phosphohistidine, okay? Now we have an activated phosphate, okay? And what I've done here is I have drawn, and actually let me go ahead and do this. I've actually, actually drawn too many, I've drawn too many phosphates on there. Let me go ahead and do it like this. Let me do it like this. Okay, there we go. So now we have this molecule right here. This is guanosine diphosphate, okay? Notice that we have the ribose here. We have the nitrogenous base here, which is guanine. And then we have two phosphates. Here's the, uh, here's the oxygen with the negative charge on the GDP, okay? And remember also, this molecule could also be ADP, right? Because if you go back and look at the reaction, of succinyl coenzyme A synthetase, it can react with both GDP and ADP. Okay, so so just bear that in mind. Okay, okay. So now what's going to happen is we have an activated phosphate on the histidine residue. Now this GDP oxygen will do a nucleophilic acyl substitution on this phosphate. You'll generate a, te a terginal bipyramidal intermediate reform the phosphate oxygen double bond and you'll kick off the histidine residue as the leaving group okay and in the process what you end up generating is a nucleoside triphosphate this one that i've drawn is gtp notice that the nitrogenous base is guanine that's why i call it gtp but just remember that you can also form atp with this reaction assuming that your nucleoside diphosphate is adp okay now one other aspect of this i want to go over is that there is a way through another enzyme, okay, and we're not going to talk about the enzyme right now, but there is another enzyme that you'll talk about in Biochem 2 that can interconvert GTP to ATP. So basically, whenever you get the GTP, because ATP is used more, oftentimes what will happen is this enzyme will interconvert GTP and ATP. So I hope this video gave you a little bit of intuition on succinyl coenzyme A synthetase. So one of the keys about this reaction is definitely understand that it's our first substrate level phosphorylation in the TCA cycle. We end up generating succinate that will continue the cycle. And of course, we get a nucleoside triphosphate where the nitrogenous base is a purine. See you in the next video. And actually, the, the video, the, the part of the video before this said that the video was over. But in fact, one of the things I did want to do is I wanted to go over the differences between synthases and synthetases. Okay, 
So the first thing we need to do is we need to define a synthase. And one thing that's interesting about synthases is that particular name really is not very specific. In fact, synthases, it really doesn't really define what the enzyme does. Um, it, oftentimes it'll tell you what it synthesizes, but the actual function of the enzyme is largely unknown based on the name. For instance, uh, PG, the, the first one I have written here, thromboxane A2 synthase, converts prostaglandin H2 into thromboxane A2. But the actual, even if I gave you the structure of PGH2, the actual name synthase is not going to help you really at all in terms of knowing what the mechanism is or what thromboxane A2 might look like. So synthase really is not a very specific name. It doesn't really tell you anything about what the enzyme does. Okay. Likewise, thymidylate synthase is it's not thymidylate synthase is technically a transferase. That's why we've labeled it as class two. So it's transferring a molecule, but it doesn't tell you exactly what it's transferring. It's just saying that it makes thymidylate, right? TMP. So these are these names are largely kind of ambiguous. They don't really tell you what it does. But if you had to define a synthase, generally what it is, and sometimes it even violates this rule, but generally they're, they're condensation reactions that don't use a nucleoside triphosphate. So if you remember, what are our nucleoside triphosphates? Well, our nucleoside triphosphates are ATP, they're GTP, they're CTP, and then usually we don't use TTP, they're U, it's UTP because what we're using, right? We're using our ribo, our ribonucleotide triphosphates, right? So you're not going to use your deoxys generally for these for reactions that would require these. You're going to use your ribonucleotides. But the whole point is that synthases don't use these. So synthases do not use these. Okay? They're simple condensation reactions that don't use these. And also the other thing that's interesting is their name is pretty ambiguous. It doesn't tell you a lot what the mechanism is or anything like that. Okay? Synthetases are class six enzymes. They're ligases. Okay? And when we talk about ligases, we can generally break them into two groups. Okay? They're the ones that do not use do not use a nucleoside triphosphate. So some ligases do not use them. So do not use a nucleoside triphosphate. And then there are some that do. So then there are some that do use a nucleoside triphosphate. And this group of ligases we call synthetases. Okay. So all a synthetase is, is it's a ligase that uses a nucleoside triphosphate. And if it doesn't use a nucleoside triphosphate, we just keep the term ligase. Okay. So an example of, an example of a ligase would be this. So there's an enzyme that basically works like this. So you have this molecule right here. And the enzyme that's going to work is called, it's called 2-amino 3-keto butyrate CoA ligase, trying to write quickly. And what you're going to get is number one, you're going to get glycine you're going to get glycine, okay? But you're also going to get acetyl-CoA, okay? Now, nowhere in this reaction did I specify that you're using a nucleoside triphosphate, and the truth is, is you're not, okay? This was an example of a ligase, and as we can clearly see from this reaction, you're taking 2-amino-3-keto-butyrate, and you're converting it to acetyl-CoA and glycine, but nowhere do you use a nucleoside triphosphate, okay? In fact, all this enzyme is doing is it's doing a nucleophilic acyl substitution. That's all it's doing, okay? Now, a synthetase, on the other hand, does use a nucleoside triphosphate. And, and the, the thing about this is generally when you say it's using a nucleoside triphosphate, it's not that it's forming a nucleoside triphosphate, it's that it's burning it. Okay? And to be specific about synthetases, they are condensation reactions that occur using a nucleoside triphosphate. So, for example, let's look at succinyl coenzyme A synthetase. Okay? So let's look at the reaction that it does. Oops. Let's look at the reaction that it does. So keep in mind that we're starting, 
with succinyl CoA, right? And it's in equilibrium, in equilibrium with succinate, right? And if we're talking about the forward direction, what did we need? Well, in the forward direction, we needed inorganic phosphate plus, let's just use GDP, right? And then we put those things in, and out comes GTP and coenzyme A, right? Okay, so this is our generic reaction for succinyl coenzyme A synthetase. Now, in the forward direction, in other words, this direction that I've drawn, this is the TCA cycle direction, right? The TCA cycle never reverses itself under physiological conditions. So it's always going to run in this direction. So in the TCA cycle direction, you're forming GTP. So technically, this enzyme in the TCA cycle direction is not a synthetase. It's not a synthetase, okay? The enzyme is actually named for the reverse reaction, even though it technically doesn't run in that direction. So if you notice, in the reverse direction, what is it going to do? Well, in the reverse direction, you're going to start with, you're going to start with GTP, and you're going to start with coenzyme A, and you're going to put those into the system, and what comes out? Well, you're going to get inorganic phosphate and GDP, assuming you start with GTP as your nucleus high triphosphate, okay? In the reverse direction, this is an example of a synthetase, okay? Because you're using a nucleoside triphosphate. In the, in the forward direction, in the TCA cycle direction, you're not using a nucleoside triphosphate. You're actually forming one. So in the forward direction, in the TCA cycle direction, it's not actually a synthetase. This enzyme is named for the reverse reaction in which you take succinate and convert it to succinyl-CoA. So if you were to isolate this enzyme, put it in your little beaker or whatever, and then throw in some succinate, it, um, it, if you load it up with succinate, it's going to force the reaction to go towards succinyl CoA, assuming you have the other um, ingredients there as well. And actually, the free energy change of this reaction favors the formation of succinate, but we know by Le Chatelier's principle, if you load it up with succinate and the other ingredients, it'll force it over to the succinyl CoA. But in the reverse direction, in the non TCA cycle direction, that's where it's classified as a synthetase because you're directly using a nuclear nucleoside triphosphate. So what's the point? Synthases are condensation reactions generally that do not use a nucleoside triphosphate. So if you were to look at the reaction of thromboxane A2 synthase, no nucleoside triphosphate. If, you're, if you look at the reaction of thymidylate synthase, no nucleoside triphosphate is used. Okay, so they're basically condensation reactions that don't use these ingredients. And in fact, there are some violations of that, okay? Thermoboxane A2 synthase is actually not really much of a condensation reaction. It's actually um, an oxidation reaction. It's an oxidation using molecular oxygen. So it's actually technified as a class one enzyme. So it's not really a condensation at all. So there are some violations to that rule, okay? But synthetases are pretty well defined. They're con con condensations, they're, oops, they're condensations that do require a nucleoside triphosphate, okay? Now let's look at this in the context of the reverse direction uh, how it's, with how it's named, right? What are you condensing? Well, you're condensing succinate and CoA, right? You're condensing this guy right here, and you're condensing it with a coenzyme A, right? And it requires... It requires the nucleoside triphosphate, which in this case is GTP. Remember that it can also use ATP. So this enzyme is named for the reverse reaction, which is really kind of stupid, right? Because the TCA cycle never goes in that direction under physiological conditions. In fact, it, it, in terms of this part of the TCA cycle, if this part ever reverses itself, you die. Okay, so this part is not going to reverse itself. And even, even if you were to slow the TCA cycle down, there's still enough driving force from Le Chatelier's principle that you're going to force this reaction to go towards succinate anyways. So TCA cycle, understand that it never reverses itself in this part of the cycle at least, and that this enzyme is named for the reverse reaction. So in the reverse direction, you're ligating coenzyme A and succinate and using the power of a nucleoside triphosphate with the nitrogenous base being a purine.